This conference will now be recorded. Okay. <clears throat> so we have seen in our last session what is IAM. IAM is a basically a service that will help you to give access to your team members through which you can control their access and you can also authenticate the AWS services to serve the purposes with another AWS service. Now the best part of this IAM is with this IAM management console, you can not only configure or create resources for your users, you can also give them control what they can do and what they cannot. And when you have this kind of features, you can actually log all the things in your AWS management console that at particular this period at this time 2 p.m. Uh, on this date, this person XYZ has access to that particular service. You can have all the logs in your system. So in case you are doing having a troubleshooting for uh, if you want to do at that time, you can actually seek for what purpose of uh, which people which team member has done that services has taken action on that particular service. So this plays an important role in our infrastructure time. So here we have four components of IAM, a user, group, role and policy. A user is something that uh, every physical user to every physical user in your, in, in your organization, organization, you give a user access and whatever the permission that you want to give, you attach to this user. Maybe a user which will have EC2 full access, S3 full access, or any other AWS service full access, read-only access, list-only access. Whatever the permission that you want to give, you can specifically define each and every permission. You have complete control where you can revoke any permission or you can add any permission in future if you want. So on AWS, there are three kinds of user. Whenever you create an AWS account, the email ID and the password that you set during the creation of account is called root account or first time access only. This account has complete access to the AWS account. All the services to the billing dashboard, to the AWS organization, every single part, this AWS root account has a control. Then comes your IAM user. I am user is something that you can give access to your team members, whatever the team number of uh, users you have, you can create a user for them. There is no limit for creation of users on AWS. And third is a federating existing user. So if you are using any cloud directory, if you are having any active directory in your organization, or if you are importing users from social media, from Google, Facebook, or Amazon, you can federate this existing user from this social media sites to AWS and give them permission, whatever you want. So these are the three users. Now, as per the AWS best practices, you should not share your credential with anyone. First, second, as per the AWS best practices, you should not use your root credentials for accessing or for doing any resource creation or for any performance. You should avoid or remove the complete access of root account because root account has complete authority to do anything. You should remove or reduce the usage of root account. So in that case, what you can do is you can create a user for yourself, give them administrator access. That person can do anything on that system. So. As an IAM user, you should log in always. Though you are a CEO, CFO, C CTO, whatever you are, top position member you are in your company, you should also, sorry, you should also use a root credential. Now you should not use the root credential. You should use the IAM user. So in every AWS account, you must have always a users with a specific policy attached. Now second comes a group. Now let's consider a scenario. There are 50 people for your developers. There are a group of 50 people that you have created on your AWS account. Now going to each users and giving them permission today, EC2, S3, Lambda, whatever the services you want to give, it's very tedious job. It's really not, it's very difficult like to go in every user's account and give them permission. 
if I have 50 users for a, uh, that belongs to a developer team, I need to go to each of these users and give them permission. So it becomes very difficult. So we have a call IAM group. Now IAM group inside this, you can add all these user and define a specific permission. <coughs> and that particular permission will be applicable to all the users. So it becomes easy to manage the permissions at the group level to all the users belong to same category, the same group. How is going to help you is in case in future, if you want to revoke any permission from this dev team, AI team, with a single click only, you can perform that. In case if you want to add more permission, then within again single click, you can add the permission. You don't need to go to each of this user and give them permission. That's why we have groups through which you can uh, manage all the users and you can create a number of groups as many as you want. Now a group can contain many users and as user can also belong to multiple groups. So you can give permission based on the groups and you can add a single user to multiple groups and it will have complete control on the AWS account. A group says you have easy to access, another group says you have S3 access. So a people or a user having inside in both the groups can have both the access to EC2 and S3 that you can do. Group can be nested like uh, in a single nest. In a group, you cannot nest another group. A group is always at the top level. And there's no default group available that whenever you create an IAM user, it will be a part of that group. There's a limit to the number of groups. Uh, previously, it was 100. Now, uh, there's an unlimited number of groups that you can create on your AWS account. So just imagine this is your AWS account. This is your corporate AWS account. And we have three groups, group admin, group dev, and group security. All right, let's say you have two users on your group admin. Yeah, sure. So federating users is like, if you are asking, if you are uh, importing users from social media sites like Google, Facebook, or Amazon, currently these three sites are supported. So if you are importing any users from this, basically many people sign up using this social media account. So you have a platform uh, like an e-commerce site where you ask user to sign up. If they are signing up using the Gmail ID or, or uh, using the Gmail, Facebook, or Amazon account, then that credential will be automatically created in your AWS account and you can give them permission. So if you want to control users based on the federation, then AWS supports that inbuilt features. It also has one AWS service called Cognito, C-O-G-N-I-T-O, Cognito. Cognito does the same job for you. You can create a pool of users where you can import a users from uh, Gmail, Facebook, or Amazon currently, these three sites are supported. You can, whenever a user create using these three links, the user ID and the password will be created and shared with your database. It will be stored on your AWS account. So that is federating existing users. So let's consider this uh, group example that is in your AWS account. You have three groups, admin, Dave, security. Let's say in admin, you have two users, Dave and Sushi. And on Dave, you have three users and similarly you have three users on security. Now, if you apply a single permission at Dave level, that permission will be applicable on your user level. That is this user, Dave will have only that particular permission, maybe EC2, maybe S3, whatever the service you want to associate. Only that particular user will have that permissions here. Similarly, if you apply two permission at the summary level, that is at the user level, it will have only that permission. No other user will have that permission. But if we apply a permission at admin level, at group level, the permission will be applicable to both the users, Dave and Sushi. So in this case, Dave will have two permission. One that is associated 
with the user level and one that is associated at the group level. So they will have both the permission. Similarly, if you apply any permission at dev level, group level, this policy will be applicable to all the users inside this group. So now Samir has three policies, three permissions he has. Two at the user level, one at the group level. Now in case if you want to change any permission at the group level, the same will reflect to all the users. If you want to revoke, if you want to add permission, it will work. Now the third concept comes is role. Role play an important role in IAM service. We know that in our software application, whenever two components interact, let's say from PHP to MySQL, whenever you do interaction, you need to create a connection. You need to give the access key, secret key, or any token services to connect to two different services. Now, AWS has multiple services, more than hundreds of services. So here we have role. A role is something that will create a private link between one service to another service. So that you do not require now to hardcore any credentials in your system, in your application. For example, let's say you're running a PHP application on your EC2 machine, all right? And your data, certain static data, certain video files, MP files or documentations are available on S3 bucket. Now you are pulling some data from S3 in your EC2 instance. So there are two services. So in this part, you don't need to hardcode the credentials in your PHP application to connect to your S3 services and then uh, use this uh, documents or objects to show on the browser. What you can do is you need to just simply create a role and once you create a role is created, a role will talk privately between EC2 instance and S3. It will make a private communication between EC2 and S3. So you don't need to hardcore any credentials in this part. An IAM role is an IAM identity that you can create in your account that has specific permission. Now, instead of you attach it to user, you can attach it to any services who wants it to access. Roles are used to dedicate access to a user's application or service that normally don't have access to the AWS resources. So basically, a role is always attached between two AWS services. If you want to have communication between two AWS services, you need to attach a role in between that. All right. And the fourth part is the policy. A policy is a document that you attach to a user, group, or role to define the permission. That is, if a user wants to have permission for accessing an EC2 machine, then you need to design a policy and that policy you need to attach it to user. Similarly, the same policy you can attach to a group, same policy you can attach it to a role. So policy is nothing but a document that defines the permission that you are allowing or denying. So this is just a simple uh, sample of how the policy looks like. Uh, it's a JSON format. There is a version. Version is defined by the AWS. This is not a date. This is a version number which is defined by the AWS and you need to use the same. Now you don't need to remember this version name. Whenever you go to the AWS console, there you will find it default. Then comes the statement body. In the statement bodies, you can define multiple policies too. So what this policy is, uh, it's saying that effect is allow, that is you are allowing this permission. Where you are allowing this permission? On S3. And on which resource? On this particular resource. Now this particular resource has an ARM. What exactly ARM is? We'll see in our next slide. So users, group, role, and policy. Any doubt in this part, in these four components? Uh, can you just you know uh, go to roles again and just you know on a high level you know just a more yeah, sure. so a role here is something that will authenticate to aws services instead of hard coining your credentials in your application whatever the application you are running 
फी नॉर्मली हार्ड को एक्सेस की सीक्रेट की और एनी टोकन नंबर और टोकन सर्विस ना वेन यू हैव अ रोल you eliminate the part of hard coding all the credentials in your system you don't now require to hard code the credentials to access another aws service so for example if your ec2 machine is having a running an application but your database is stored on dynamo db you are sending a push notification via sns aws sns service and for the backend purposes you are using aws lambda for storing your objects for storing your data you are using s3 now when you are making such connection with all the different aws services here you don't need to hard code all the credentials and apply on your php application whatever the application you are running in simply what you need to do is you need to create a role that will authenticate all the services can have access by the ec2 now ec2 can privately talk to any of the services if ec2 wants to have communication with s3 with this dedicated link of a role it can do similarly with this private communication it can write the data to the dynamo db it can fetch the data from the dynamo db whatever the interaction you want to do between two aws services you can do with this role this is the most secured way of communication between two aws services all right Okay. Yeah. One more question. Lalit, I have a question. Uh, see, whenever you're going to create a role between, for example, EC2 instance and S3 bucket, okay. Uh, in future, mm -hmm. I can use the same role name uh, to establish the connection between the uh, EC2 instance and S3 bucket for uh, for uh, other uh, applications. Right. You can do that. A single role can be applicable to all the number of EC2 instances you want. Okay, and and also for example, if I if I want to access other other services, again I have to create one more role for that. Right, you need to based on which service want to have access to what services, you need to create a role for that. For example, okay. let's say S three wants to have communication with Lambda, so here you need to okay. create a role for S three that will authenticate to use or access the a the Lambda service. Okay. For example, uh, uh, if I if I want to access the lambda function through uh, to S3 and where this lambda function is going to be linked to the SNS, uh, if it's uh, for example if it reaches some threshold or if it uh, there is a condition, uh, once it satisfies that condition, it should connect to the S, uh, SNS. Okay. Right. And uh, lambda is connected to S3, and uh, who is responsible for uh, giving the roles to uh, SNS? Is that S3 or Lambda? Okay. So, for example, like if a Lambda is some if Lambda is invoking a relationship with SNS, then Lambda must have attached that role to create a communication with SNS. If S3 is going to communicate with SNS, then you need to create a relationship between S3 and SNS. The service which will invoke the another service must have that role. So in your case, if Lambda is going to access the SNS service for sending the notification, then you must attach it to the Lambda. Now my question is like uh, this: Lambda is going to access the S3. Okay. Lambda is linked with the S3, and uh, if it satisfies some condition, then uh, the Lambda should be connected to the SNS. Right. So Lambda will have two permissions now. One that connects to the S3 and another that connects to the SNS, with the same role for defined. And for uh, for SNS, I think for SNS, uh, not required to add that SNS role, right? No, that is not required. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is a body of a policy. What are the different parameters of a policy statement that you can use? That is first is version. That version defines uh, what uh, AWS version you are using, and you need to use the same version. Uh, you don't need to remember. There is AWS uh, console available where you find it directly. Then comes the second part statement. Now in the statement part, you can add multiple statements like a policy. As you mentioned, there is a Lambda function, so you can define a statement that Lambda can have access to the S3, and second statement that Lambda can have access to the SNS. 
you can define two different permission within the same policy here so SID is defines SID is differentiates the two policy one that is you attaching to the S3 and one that is attaching to SNS you can give a name that is SID effect allow or deny whether you are allowing the service whether you are denying the service you can define that rule principle is something that who is going to access the service if lambda is going to access the service then here you need to define a lambda if a user want to have access to the ec2 machine then you will define a username if a group of users who is going to assign uh, access this ec2 machine then you need to define the group name so which service is going to access the another service that name you need to define it here in the principal section then action different aws services have different list of action read action write action management action list only action there are different kinds of actions available based on your requirement based on your condition you can select one of the condition and apply then resource resources in an optional section resource defined if you want to attach it to a particular resource let's say out of my 20 ec2 machine i want to apply a permission only on a single machine then which single machine can have access to which single resource let's say there are 20 lambdas available that 20 lambdas hit to 20 different s3 bucket but i want to deny one of my lambda function to have access to one of my s3 bucket then i can write the specific then i can mention that specific resource that only to this resource you should not access the data that resource i can mention it here and condition is uh, another circumstances under which uh, uh, the policy will be granted like if the policy is allowed on it then it will uh, you can define here the permission if this is true then only this must be enabled if a request is coming for 443 then only it should be allowed whatever the policy whatever the condition is you can define it here which is optional Now there are certain IAM best practices, but it would be great like if you saw, first see what AWS IAM on the lab, on the AWS console, and then we will come back here to see actually. All right. So, um, Shubham, you there? Yes, Lalit, I'm here. Uh, yeah, can you just create a AWS account for everyone? Yeah, sure. So, so I need sharing, to go to okay yeah i'm sharing the link with you can you share me your screen i'll do i'll do just a moment You able to see my screen? Um, not exactly. There is a play button that you need to click on it. Just below your mic, there is a video, uh, video conference call, then screen sharing, and then there is a play button. Just a moment, let me open the link that you have uh, sent. Shivam, uh, like uh, how, you're going to create the accounts now, or uh, it's only like for the demonstration purpose you're creating and showing us? So you can let me know. So, Gopi, like in case if you want, I can create an account. Yeah, but at this moment, uh, he needs account for himself, no? like for showing the, uh, the lab uh, activities, right? Be because these things, you know, we are going to try it in the offline, rather at this moment. So, Lalit, Lalit, can you just put more light on this? Uh, it's like you want to uh, do the lab session right now, right? Along with me, you will also do the lab sessions. No, my expectation was that you run through that, you show the complete activities. We will do this activities in offline. Maybe. 
Okay, anything is good for me. If you want to try right now, you ah, can Lalit, have it. See, that's perfectly fine because ultimately we are recording the session. So you can tell them all the guidelines and instructions how to create the account and you can go ahead and by today end or tomorrow I will share the recordings of those two classes and then all uh, five of them can create their own account do these sort of things that they want to do at their end and in the next sure. session you can probably uh, have a question and answer on their queries. Sure, sure. Sound, anything is good for me. All right. Fine, uh, Gopi. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, so Lalit, uh, sorry. Uh, so I feel there is no as such uh, my requirement here. So can I just right. leave the meeting? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Yeah. So if you want to create an AWS account, uh, you can use the same signing link here, which I have shared with you or with the mail. And then what you need to do is just click here, create a new AWS account. And here you need to uh, uh, give your details here, the email ID, passwords, and then here you need to give a name to your AWS account, just a name, uh, which should be a single string only. Uh, you cannot give a space in between two names. And when then you click on continue, you will be asked some personal details. Oh, let me just show you. Okay, here you can select your personal thing and you can fill your enter details here. Click on this that you indicate that you are read the agreements. Click and create and continue. Once you do create and continue, you will be asked to enter your credit or debit card details. Once you provide your details, uh, first of all, they will deduct your two rupee from your account. It's just two rupee INR which will be refunded back to your AWS, which will be refunded back to your bank account within 14 days. Then you will get a call from AWS team and they will give you a four digit of OTP number that you need to uh, enter in the section. And also you need to verify your email address, which will be dropped on your email ID, the one that you have used. So once this process is being created, now you have one email ID and password that you have set for uh, accessing your AWS account and that is your root account. All right. Then you can just visit to console.awsamazon.com site. And here you can define your email ID, passwords, and you will be signing to your AWS account. All right. Now, once you have signed up to your AWS account, these are the regions where you are allowed to create your infrastructure. There are 21 different regions. Out of that, two of them are restricted because two regions are restricted only for US government and China government. All right. Now, what I would suggest you is to first go to the your name here, whatever the name that you will give, and just click on my building dashboard. So this is the billing dashboard, whatever the consumption that you will do, based on that, whatever the charges you will need to pay, you will find the your bill here. Now, as you are completely unaware of how AWS account works and what are the different services, I would recommend you to create a one budget. That is on the left hand side, you see there is a budget. Now this budget will help you to get notified if you exceed your budget amount. So click on create budget, uh, select the cost budget. And then here you can give your name here anything. And here you can set your budget amount to be one, just $1. Because we are going to access all our AWS services within your free tier. We should not get charged uh, different from what we are doing. And we'll try to maintain the same thing here. So you just give your minimum bu uh, budget amount here one and then click on create and configure alerts. There you need to provide your email ID. That is here you can see actual podcast 80. 
So once this amount is reached to $0.80, you will get notified that you have already consumed a lot of services, which has cost you $0.80. And here you can provide your email ID. Once you do this, click on confirm budget and done. So if your budget reaches, if you are exceeding your free tier, then it will trigger your notification that you can uh, then terminate your services, whatever the services you are running through which you are getting charged, you can terminate the service. Uh, one, one thing, uh, this is something just, uh, it is going to send a notification, right? It, yeah. It's not going to uh, stop the services which we are going to use. No, 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 it will not stop anything. It will not stop anything. It will just give you a notification that whatever the budget that he has set, it is exceeding that budget. That's it. This uh, notification is something, uh, it's on a regular schedule based or one time it's going to uh, send it. Okay. Basically here you have set to the period is monthly. That is, it will send you every month. Every month it will budget, it will make a budget of $1. And then if the budget is exceeded, then you will get notified. You can change it to uh, quarterly or annually, whatever it is you want. Okay. Every month here, if you exceed that budget, you will get notified. You will only get notified. It will not terminate any services. It will not do any actions. Okay. All right. So once you are done, then I think uh, you will be in under control. That's it. You will not get charged for that. Now, this is my AWS management console. And here I can access to all the AWS services. And if I click on here and I search IAM, the first AWS service that we are talking about, I can list here. Um, so once you create a, your AWS account, you will find all this into an alert mark. I'll just make it alert mark, just seem less like your AWS account. Just give me a second. All right. So once you have created your AWS account, you will find the same thing here. That is one will be the tick mark and other will be in the alert mark. So what exactly it is? First is delete your root access keys. As we have discussed, AWS best practices says you should not use the root credentials. Similarly, every credential, every username and password comes up with another root access. Root access contains an access key ID and secret key that can be used for CLI purposes or SDK or API. For that purposes, you can have uh, access key and secret key. So it's very important that you should delete that part. We are not using this access key secret key for the root account. Second comes is activate MFA on your root account. So click on it, manage MFA, Just click on MFA. MFA is multi-factor authentication. That is whenever a new user will sign into the AWS console. Now this MFA is for the root account. So whenever I log in via this my root account, I need to provide my username, password, and then six digit MFA code. Now this six digit MFA code will not be, uh, you will get on your SMS. How you will get it via an authenticator. You can download this authenticator in your mobile phone. Just search for authenticator and there is a Google authenticator available. The first link, which is also available for iOS and Google both. You need to just install this application and then click on activate MFA. Now there are two types, virtual MFA and hardware MFA. Virtual MFA is using this authentic authenticator tool you can use and sign into your AWS account. And second is hardware based MFA. Hardware based MFA is something that you need to buy that hardware and then it will authenticate with this hardware. This is most uh, secured way of, of logging to the AWS console. 
but this is something that you need to purchase and it's very costly that is hardware based mfa device so as of now you can go with the virtual mfa and then click on continue once you do this there is a one qr code and a secret key available you can use any one of this so if you are downloaded this application authenticator then you can open this authenticator app and here they, you will find one plus button Uh, like this you will find your plus button you need to click on this plus button and you need to scan this QR code There is also an API available uh, for Chrome browser Here you can see uh, I have this Google authenticator here For my web console So what I do is I just click on edit add I have both options to scan a QR code or a manual entry. I can do anything I will go with the manual entry and I will copy this secret key give a name to my account AWS account root MFA and pass here the secret key that I have copied and click on OK here it is the six digit code now what I need to do is click on here and it will be copied to my clipboard and I need to paste it here and then after every 30 seconds this code will be refreshed this is time spent based on MFA after every 30 seconds this uh, MFA code will change so the newly created MFA I need to again copy and pass it here and then click on assign MFA now what will happen every time I log in with this root account I need to sign in with this two factor authentication one with my email id and password and second with this two factor code all right so this is what you need to do and this is the best practices that you need to always follow for a root account then we have create individual im user so let's go to the user and create a im user to create a user just click on add user give a name let's say john you can add multiple users whatever you want number of users you can create at the same time and what kind of access do you want to give do you just want to give a CLI access that is via access key ID and secret key ID that can be used for AWS API CLI SDK or do you want to give this kind of management console you can give both that is also acceptable if you are giving a management console you need to generate a password or you can give a custom password let's give my custom password and do you require to reset like whenever you give to a user do that user require to reset the password this is again optional you can set it or not i'm not going next is permission now to set a permission there are three tools one you can add a user to a group so that if any group has a permission that same policy will be attached to the user but as of now we don't know what is group and how to create group so we will not go through this second says copy permission from existing user it means if there is only existing users available in your system on which you want to uh, the same policy you want to copy to the newly created newly creating user then you can select one of the user but in our case this is a first user so we do not go with this option so we go with the third option that is attach existing policy directly now these are the different AWS manager policy here you can see there is a logo AWS logo and the type is AWS manage these are the different permission that the AWS is showing you these are approximately 481 permission but whenever you create an AWS account you will find around 450 455 around something the remaining permissions the remaining policy I have created so these are the AWS managed permissions if I click on filter and my own custom manager policies then these are my created own custom policy <clears throat> so if I want to attach these permissions I can go with this or I can go with AWS managed permissions whatever I want now when I click on administrator access this policy will be attached 
if I want to give EC2 full access, I can search here EC2 full access and this permission will be copied here. Similarly, S3 full access, S3 read access, so it will give only S3 read only access. The permission that you will select, only that particular permission will be applied. All right. So then click on next tags. Uh, if you want to give a tag to this user, which uh, that user belongs to this particular team members or team, you can define this values here. This is optional. Then review and click on create user. <clears throat> now you have a user called John. This is the access key. There is a one secret key associated with this. And there is a password. Password is something that we have already set. And this is a sign link that every time this user needs to use to log into that AWS console. Now, once you have created this AWS IAM user, you need to download the CSV. The next time you won't be able to find the CSV. This is a one time thing only. Let's just close this part. So we have now a John user. A John user has three permissions, EC2, read only, and administrator access. Basically, an administrator access gives you entire access to the AWS account to all the services. So it doesn't matter if you have EC2 full access or not, it already have that. So in case I want to deassociate or detach this policy, I just need to click on cross mark. Yes, detach. Similarly, I will also remove the S3 because this administrator will have access complete control. If user, if this user is a part of any group, then you will find here a list of groups all tags, whatever the permissions, tags that you have added, you will have a list of all the tags here. And then come the security credential. That is, you have enabled the uh, console password. In case the user forgot the password, and it comes to you to reset the password. You can just click on manage and change the password from here. Do you want to assign this user to have MFA? And again, you can do the same procedure. Manage, click on manage, go with the virtual or the hardware, click on continue. You will get a one QR code. You scan that QR code from the user's mobile and then uh, the MFA will be activated. And here you have access key and secret key. Now you can maintain at a time two access key and secret key. If you lose your access key and secret key, a user must at the same time should uh, inform the solution architect or the administrator person that the access key and secret key has been lost. Please make it inactive so that before it reaches to unethical user you should delete it or you should make it inactive and then you can create a new access key from here all right in this part any question in doubt uh, regarding this aws users you have complete control here to change the password to change the permissions and everything can you just show the customized one just like what options are there uh, customized uh, custom secret key access key. Uh, there was a filter no? uh, where you can uh, select the AWS managed services or not. I think it was there in the policies. Policies, I think. Oh, uh, you mean permission? permission? Okay. Yeah. Now there was a filter. Okay. In case if you want to add any permissions, you again click on add permissions and attach the existing policy, whatever you want. Uh, filter policies, right? When you click on that, there is one more option called custom info. Yeah, there's a custom, custom and, yeah. and there's a manage. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, show us any custom or manage one. No? Uh, okay. You want to see the customer manage permissions. So these no. are the permissions that I have created in my AWS account. How to create these permissions? We'll see in the policy part. Okay. So here is the IAM user. This is just a single part of your IAM part. Now the interesting part is that 
user ARN. I'll just copy this. Now this is the ARN. ARN stands for Amazon Resource Name. A name and number both can be used. Every resource that you will create, either that resource will have a ID, a logical ID, or a ARN. ARN defines a unique identity of that particular resource. Maybe you have 10 DynamoDB table, maybe you have 10 EC2 machine, maybe you have 10 Lambda function. Every resource will have a unique ARN. So how a unique ARN is generated? The first part is the ARN. Second is AWS, which is always the main constant, is two part. Third is the service. If it is a Lambda, then the name will be the Lambda. If it is S3, name will be the S3. So it's a name of a service. Then here comes your 12 digit account ID. Whatever the account ID you have, uh, it will be automatically fetched and it will be applied here. And then the next part is what resource you are creating. So we are here creating a user called John. If it is a S3 bucket, then here uh, it will be your S3, name of a bucket and the file. If it is a Lambda function, here it will be Lambda and name of a Lambda function. If it is a group, then here the name of a group uh, that is here, the, instead of user, there will be a group and the name of a group. So this is a unique and common format that is using by the AWS to differentiate different AWS services. This is called ARN, Amazon resource name. Now going to the second part. Now, before I go to the second part, what I will do is I will remove this permissions also. That is administrator access. We are not giving this user to have any kind of access. Sorry, Lalit, uh, there is a query. Uh, Lalit, what is an access advisor? Access advisor. If you are giving this uh, user to have a cross account access, like this user will have access to another AWS account, then it will list all the services here. This user will have, maybe you have an AWS account and from your AWS account, if that particular user you have given only EC2 access, then here you will find that EC2 access here. Uh, that we already mentioned in the permissions, right? Where we are going to give the full access to uh, EC2 or something. Like this is in your AWS account and this is when you have cross AWS account access. Okay, okay, got it, got it. All right. Okay, and one more question, uh, like, uh, can I can I give the access to these uh, policies or uh, any roles to uh, to the user? Okay, example, you, can, just... you can only give user to attach a policy. You can always attach a policy to a user or a group. You cannot associate a role to a user or a group role is always in between two aws services if you want to give a user a permission to access any services you need to attach a policy now, what i mean to say is uh, for example if there are three users uh, under the admin okay okay and uh, can i give the access to this uh, uh, identity and access management uh, any of the services to them to to do some changes yes Yes, we can just click on add permission and whatever the service you want to do, you can give the permission. Maybe for example, uh, for example, billing services. Yeah, you can give the billing services. Just click on here, give the billing services and attach this permission. This user will have now billing service access. Okay. Now, if you want to manage all these three users at the same time, if you want to give permission all the three users at the same time, you can just create a group. Now, here before we go, we have seen this in a join user, we have removed all the permission, all the administrator access and everything. So now going to the group, we'll create a small group. Let's call a group called admin. Next step, which permission that you want to attach? This is at the group level. We are not attaching any permissions here. All right. 
going to the next step here and click on create group so this user or oh, sorry this group is called group admin which do not have any users which do not have any permissions let's do one by one let's add a user to this group the one that we have just created john user click here and add user same permissions attach policy now whatever the permissions whatever the policies that you want to attach you can do it here let me attach i mr texas and the billing one attach policy now you can see this group level has two permission billing and administrator access and it contains a user called john now if i go to the john user and see the permissions it has both the permission automatically attached and these permissions are attached from the group not individually all right this is how you can manage the permissions here Uh, whatever it is discussed before like uh, it should be better uh, to create a user than that of accessing the uh, root uh, root account right uh, sorry once again pardon uh, it's better to have the separate user even for uh, the root user also instead of accessing the root uh, credentials it's better right. to create a uh, as a root uh, as a user right so i have created a user called john and i have given an administrator and the billing access which is the normal permission that we need to give to create another aws service or to create another iim user so now i can just log in via the john user and i can do other any other things that i want to so that uh, i can run to my no, root, account. The root user I'm talking about root user not a uh, the, the user what you just uh, talking about even for the root user also he has to uh, uh yes to add a separate user account other than the root access right the beginning you just discussed about that. now how can you uh, remove the access from the root account root account is something that will have complete access from this root no, account you will, create, you will create another user through which you will give a minimum permission that user can create another users now instead of using my root credentials i will use now john user to have other aws services to work for me like to create another users for another team members or any kind of services that i want to run okay basically uh, what you are saying, basically what you are saying is uh, you should not use their root credential and you should create a user for them right exactly yes yes so that's what i did i have created a user and given the permission now i will use this user to do the further things creation of roles policy or any other resource creation i will use this account but the first step needs to be done from the root credentials without accessing the root credential how one can create a user account it's better to use through user accounts rather than uh, root credentials right right yeah. this was all right no, no, Uh, one more quick question, Manal. Right? We sent the budget right when you logged in first time for the account. Uh, sorry, what's again? Uh, you, we, you know, you remember like uh, just a few minutes back, you said the uh, budget uh, conditions like it should right. be less than uh, like one dollar. So the question is that like let's say you have created like twenty, you know, the IM users in the same account okay. ID. So the whatever the limit you have said, that number kind of comprises of all the 20 users usage, right? Yeah, it's a bit of entire AWS account. This is a budget of AWS account, not to a particular user. User. So okay. So even if the 20 users, whatever they individually they use it, and the billing what is going to happen? that everything will come under the same uh, the budget like right? the total what we have uh, defined as a threshold right because all these users belong to a same aws account whatever we will create it will be happen on the same aws account so you will get charge on the aws account not on the im user so whatever the consumption yeah. that that will be constructively 
okay now we have given a billing uh, no permission to this particular user when he access the billing is it something it's going to show the only usage of this particular user or else uh, yeah. the usage related to the account the usage to the account not to the user whatever the usage will be on the aws account table will be there that user can see that thing so uh, as a user i cannot see only my usage you know how much it's going to happen no 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 uh, how much it's no no only you cannot see your usage you, you don't even have that feature you will see so, at the Mm, is, is there any way because normally i'm trying to see like in, let's say if we have three users then consolidate uh, numbers being shown as in the billing then how will i come to know that you know which user used which you know resource on uh, like you know, street price does it give any sort of a report at least yeah you will get a report like which user has performed what action what are the resources that the person has created you can get the report but you will not get the which user has uh, billed the exact amount that feature is not available but you can get a list of all the logs that what user has created which services what operations that a person has performed that is possible total utilization is there okay all right so moving ahead we have role now before we create a role let's just see the policy because roles require a policy custom policy so we'll see first policy now these are the policies that is created by the AWS that is AWS managed policy you can see also logo and when you have a customer policy managed policy you don't see any icons here and the type is customer managed now take what happens when you have AWS managed services AWS managed policy comes with two things one only read only permission and second comes full access it doesn't have any custom policy options available so in that case we need to create our own policy so just click on create policy if you are familiar with the json language you can write your statements body and anything you can write here otherwise you can use the visual editor which will automatically write the json file so how to do that you need to first select a service that is let's say ec2 now we are creating a policy for EC2 to have access to my S3 buckets. All right. And what actions do you want to perform? Now you can see there are a list of actions you can see here. That is, I can describe the list of things. I can do whatever things I want. There are a lot of things for the read permissions, tagging permissions, and there are a lot of uh, write permissions available. And if you don't know one of the services what exactly it is you can just click on this question mark and you will see the description it creates a vpc with a specific cidr block so if you give this permission the user will be able to create a cidr for your vpc but there are different kinds of permissions available you can select one of them now let's say for our case we'll give list only permission read permission or uh, let's say just give the all permission. All right. And here it asks the resources on which particular resource you want to give. If you have any limitations, if you have any uh, you know condition, you can add a resource ARN. You can just copy the ARN and paste it here. Or I would say to all the resources. Now, if I click on JSON, you'll find the JSON document will be automatically written. That is, this policy is allow EC2 and to all the resources. Similarly, now I can write and give permission to S3. And instead of EC2, I would say S3. So it will allow all the permissions to all the resources on S3. That is, S3 access. I can change EC2 access just for easy purpose and then i can remove this policy give a name let's say ec2 s3 access whatever description you want to give and click on create policy 
So this policy will be created. Name is EC2 iPhone S3. You can find it here, which is customer manage policy. Now let's create a policy and associate to a role that EC2 access, EC2 can have access to the S3. Let's go to the role, click on role, and which service can have access to another service. So let's say EC2 to have access to S3. Click on next permission. You define your permission here, S3 full access, whatever you want. Now in case we have created our own policy, that is EC2 iPhone S3 access. I can associate that same policy here also on the list of different policy. I can select one of the policy and give the permission. Tax review, give a role name, EC2 full access to S3. Okay and then click on create rule. So where is our role? Here is our role. Now we need to understand a very small part. This role has its own URL, own ARN. This role is attached to EC2. You can find in the trusted relationship and this trusted relationship we have defined EC2 to have full access to the, eight, uh, to the S3, that is your trusted relationship with your EC2 and the permission that you have given is S3. A trusted relation can be an AWS service. If you are having a cross account access, like from your account access, if you are trying to access my AWS account, then the trusted relationship be your ARN. I can copy your ARN here and put it into this edit trusted relationship and instead of service instead of principal i will add your arn your user ARN, and then we can you can control to my aws account based on this you can define the temporary hours or duration of period that this role will be accessible if you are giving a temporary permission to any users then you can provide here your time one hour two hours whatever the number of hours you want and it will be custom it will be very temporary credentials so in this way you can attach this policy now our role is created but it doesn't mean that your ec2 instance can talk to the s3 for that you need to first attach this role to that particular machine then only it will support all right so we have seen user groups roles and policy do you have any doubt in this part It looks good, Daniel. All right. Now here we go to the account setting. Now account setting is something that you can customize if you want. That is how big uh, a user password should be. This is at the AWS account level, right? The number of users you have, the whenever they are set the password, what should be the minimum length? If you require to have at least one uppercase data, small case data, whatever the number of things that you want to add, you can just click here and click on apply password policy. Let's say a user must have seven digits of number. They must have at least one uppercase, one lowercase. They must have a number in their password. Should have or should not have the alphanumeric character. It's up to you. I will not go with that. Allow user to change their password. Like if the time frame is completed, then they can uh, request to a new password then this is a very important feature that is enable password expiration you define here a time frame that after this particular period the password will be reset automatically if i say 10 days after this 10 days the password will expire and the user need to sign in with a new password this aws will give them option to that your password has been expired click here enter your old password enter your new password and your new password will be activated just like in all the banking side second option is prevent password reuse like how many number of password fast password that you need to remember so if i stay here 
two. Then the last two password that I use uh, in my expiration during the period of expiration, I cannot use the last two password. So this is again it's totally up to you. And do you require password expiration requires administration reset? But as a solution architect, as an administrator, do you require to always reset your password? It's completely up to you. And then you click on apply password policy. And this password policy will be updated. Whenever a user will update the password uh, after every 10 days, it needs to uh, request for a new password. So this is your AWS, creation of user, groups, roles, and policy. Let me know if you have any doubt in this part. All right, so moving ahead, we have left one small thing that is called AWS best practices for the IAM. So you see that what are the IAM best practices and this is very important from exam point of view. First, create individual users. Instead of sharing your own credential with anyone, though you are sharing for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is, you should always create a individual users. Second, manage permissions with group. That is, uh, you should add all the users to a group and you should manage the permission at group level instead of user level so that you can revoke or add permission whenever you want. Then grant least work privileges, like the number of services they want to have access only, you should grant the least privileges only. If the person who wants to have only EC2 access, then you should give only EC2 access, S3 access, and only S3 access. Whatever the permission that you want to give, you should give it only that particular services only. Configure strong password policy. Just now we have seen one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, expiration period, and etc. You should always enable this multi factor authentication that is two step verification for every single user and the root account. Instead of uh, writing or hard coding your credentials in your AWS applications, in your uh, EC2 application, you must use these roles to connect to all the AWS services. Key rotation, that is expiration of your password, how frequently you want to uh, rotate your keys and everything, you can define it here. And lastly, reduce or remove root access. You should reduce as much as you can or you should completely remove your root access. You can create another user and give them administrator and billing access and you can create again whatever the number of services you want to do, whatever the actions you want to perform. With that user, you can do. All right. These are the very important uh, best practices that you must always remember from exam point of view. Uh, well, again, you know, I'll go back to that uh, billing thing. So other than budget, you know, is there any other provisions, you know, available uh, on the root user level to monitor the, you know, the uh, costing billing part? Uh, no, there is no other thing available. You can do auditing on your AWS account, how many utilization you have made and everything that you can do. But at a single level, you cannot. Okay. How about the alert system? Other than budget, is there any other alert systems where you can set? Uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of alert systems available. Alert system based on the resources. If you have consumed a number of uh, EC2 machines, if your EC2 machine fails to perform, if your EC2 machine has reached to 80% of utilization, for all these actions, you can perform and create an alarm. All the AWS services come with a default monitoring service. It's called CloudWatch. This basic plan is already included in your billing dashboard and all the AWS services. You can monitor your services, you can check the health of your services and do etc. So let's say you have an EC2 machine that has reached to 70% of utilization. Then you can call such alarm that if an EC2 machine reaches to 70% of utilization, it should trigger a notification or it should create automatically a new EC2 machine support the load you can do all this automation in your aws account yeah that is uh monitoring the 
utilization of the resource i'm looking at the costing perspective in the billing no billings can be only done at the aws account level if you are having a two or more aws account then again you can have a list separate list of uh, billing dashboard at the account level let's say my account is a parent account and inside this parent account i have two child account so how much utilization has been made in my child account that i can see at the high level but not uh, with the user level i can see so you mean if this has consumed what uh, sorry to interrupt you yeah uh, my question was that if we have a root user is it something like i can create one more account under that no 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 we are talking about two aws account you will have two aws account though with the same uh, different email id you can use the same uh, credit card or debit card and then you can associate in one account that is there will be one parent account who will made all the billings and then you have a separate child account so the link between those two accounts will be the credit card you now which is used uh, for the both yeah. accounts the credit card will be uh, applied on the first parent account all the child account whatever they will do uh, they can have the billings will be done by the parent account Yes, parent account first. Whatever account they created first, no? But where do you have a problem? You know, to create that account. He's telling. The... No, no. You create a new separate account. You use the same credit card. Again, yeah. So it means uh, the accounts are linked through the you know your credit card itself. That that will act as a link between the accounts. No, no. Credit card will not link all this AWS account. You need to link it yourself. You need to go. To, yeah, you go to the my organization, and then you can create your organization. There is one parent. There is another two account, which is child. You can create an organization in this AWS organization part. Now, what will happen? I tell you. Let's say you have one parent account, and then you have four child account. If each of these four child account has consumed four dollar of usage, four dollar of usage. Then this four into four, sixteen dollar needs to be paid by this parent account. The billing will be made on the parent account, not on the child account. On this parent account, you can have logs of all the four accounts, that the number of resources, the number of users, what they are doing. You can do all the auditing thing on the parent account. Yeah, I got this point. You know, I'm trying to see like where can I create the child account. Basically, how are you making the relationship uh, between the parent and the child? Okay, first of all, you need to create two AWS account. AWS okay. account, AWS account P. All right. Then you create on create organization. And here you click on add account. Uh, from here also you can create another account. In in quite an existing. Hello. Yeah. So here you are actually my already account is already linked to another parent account, so it doesn't allow me. So mm -hmm. it will drop me an email notification. Once I verify that account, then I will be able yeah. to access the service. Just a minute, I will verify. So you don't you can't do that. No, I don't think so. Fine. Uh, uh, you can move forward. Yeah. Just I was trying to see where the linkage is happening. You know, I, I was not aware of that uh, AWS organization. No. This is the AWS So whenever you click on this AWS organization, you can create uh, your tree, one parent tree, another uh, child account, everything. Okay. Yeah, you can move forward. All right. So that is our AWS IAM service. Let me know if you have any doubt in the IAM part, or we can move ahead to our second part, EC2. We will see how to create a resources, EC2 machines, and everything.
All right. Second service is Amazon EC2. EC2 stands uh, for Elastic. Just a minute, uh, can you give us a minute? Just I'm checking uh, in one second. Yeah. Lalit, uh, we can move forward, yeah, we're good. <coughs> okay, great. So, EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. Amazon EC2 provides a scalable, uh, yeah, Amazon provides a scalable computing capacity in the AWS cloud. Using EC2, you eliminate your invest time to invest in running up your hardware. That is designing an AWS data center, designing a data center, configuring an EC2 machine, creation of server and everything. Whatever the time you will require, you can eliminate this part and you can focus more on designing your product. How you can design your product and deploy your services, you can focus and your, you can invest your time in that. So I said it's one of the most great uh, services and one of the great features for the startups. Startup don't need to pay for a heavy upfront. Startup don't need to pay for designing such infrastructure. They can directly use this AWS services for creation of their service. The first concept in the EC2 is Amazon Machine AMI, that is EMI. And EMI is nothing but a template, a small template that will describe which operating system you want to install what how you need to uh, boot that ec2 machine that is uh, booting up your system whatever the commands that you will require to boot a system it will have all this information apart from that it can have an optional things like if you want to have apache server if you want to have mysql server or any other packages if you want to download and install this ami will have all the details about it so ami will take only the information for running up your EC2 machine, for booting up machine and configuration of this machine. You can also create your own AMI. Let's say I have created one EC2 machine. Uh, maybe it's a Ubuntu server. On top of that, uh, I have installed Apache server. All right. I have one Ubuntu server. On that, I have installed Apache server. Now, when I install Apache server, I have written certain data inside my EC2 machine, right? Whenever I downloaded the file, the file will be downloaded and it will be installed in my EC2 machine, correct? So actually we have written some data in our EC2 machine. Now, when we take a snapshot of this EC2 machine, this EC2 machine will contain the base information about your operating system and what is the data which is written in your system. That is your Apache server. So whenever you create your own AMI, it will automatically include all the data which is written in your disk. Maybe a system which uh, gives you Ubuntu server, Apache install, MySQL install, and a WordPress install. Now you can use the same AMI to launch or to replicate your new machines. Let's say I want to create a four, five, hundreds of machines. I can use now custom AMI that will include all these parameters. 
a boost uh, WordPress install site. Now, every time I don't need to go to each of these EC2 machine, download the Apache server, download the PS uh, MySQL, and download the WordPress. This already contains all the information, and the data is been just replicated. So this is a very good for replication of your machine. So AMI provides the information required to launch an instant. It will have all the basic information for booting up a system. You need to specify an AMI to launch an instance. So first step to launch an EC2 machine is to select an AMI. Now, when you take your own custom AMI, it only captures the data which is written into the disk, not the data which is in on RAM or ephemeral storage. It will only take the data which is only written onto the disk. It contains the root volume information about the instance, how to boot the EC2 machine, and if there is any other packages is included like apache server or anything it will have the same features you can give the launch permission that controls the aws account that can use the ami now there is a one thing that you need to remember amis are region specific every ami will give you certain option like a core vanilla or an ami and an operating system with different packages and you will be get charged separately for this AMI. Based on this region, based on this operating system, you will be get charged for that. Because we know like most of the Linux instances are free. These are public instances, public uh, license. But when we talk about the Windows server, uh, Windows machine, Windows require a license, right? So these license are Certain in certain regions they are cheaper and in certain regions they are costly. Like if you compare an Indian license with an US license, US license will be uh, somehow, somehow very cheaper. So when you change a region to region, the AMI also changes, and that's the region, and that's the reason why you have different AMI IDs. To all the different AMI, you will find a different AMI ID. So let's consider there is an AMI which will offer you a Red Hat based system with Apache installed. Now the same configuration you will find in Mumbai region, the same configuration you will find in the North Virginia, the same configuration you will find in all the other AWS region. But they will be changed in the AMI ID. And based on this AMI ID, which one you are using, you will be get charged for that. That's why AMI is a region specific. At the same time, let me just show you. So this is my AWS console, and I am in currently North Virginia, all right? And I click on here, EC2. So this is my AWS dashboard, EC2 dashboard. I just click on launch instance. So the first step is choose an AMI. Now here you can see there are a list of AMIs available. Amazon itself has its own custom AMI. This is the Amazon Tool AMI. This is the Amazon Linux AMI 1. What it offers you? It includes pre installed CLI, Python, Ruby, Perl, Java, and the depository lies Docker, PHP, MySQL. So it already includes all these packages. Then you have plain Red Hat, SUSE Linux, Ubuntu Server, then Microsoft Windows Server, and there are a lot of other AMIs available. Now, whenever you create an AWS account, you are not eligible. You are eligible, but every AMIs are chargeable, except the one that will tag free tier eligible. So, if you use one of this tag, one of this AMI which has tag free tier eligible, you will not get charged for that. Now, most of these are the Linux instances which already having a public license. You will not get charged. But if you see Windows, Windows also come with a free tier. Second, if you have your own custom AMI, the one that you have created, you will find here in this list in the My AMI section. Third is AWS Marketplace. That is, certain companies have designed their own AMI, which offers you certain features. If you want to buy any of this uh, AMIs, you can purchase it here. Like Barcuda's Cloud Generation Firewall Security Related AMI available. Here we have 10 micro Cisco, uh, 10 micro deep security based AMI. You can just go inside that and you can see 
what exactly they are offering it start from 0.01 dollar per host per hour and if you see this it start from 0.0 uh, 0.60 dollar per hour and if you go for a monthly annual package you will get 12 percent saving on that so here you can have a list of all the different ami that offers and then you have community ami that is what community you want to go amazon linux centerverse tbn fedora let's say i want to go with the fedora so in the fedora so you have various uh, you know different configurations available then which architecture you want to go 32 64 uh, that is uh, 64 bit or 64 ARM. Which one you want to go? You can select that. I want to go with the 32 based system here. Second part is the root device. Now, root device is the next part. We'll see uh, first here. So, you got it. What is the AMI, right? Any doubt in this AMI part? All right. Second comes the instance family. Instance family means the processor that you want to go. A T2 micro, T2 large, whatever the number of families you have. Each of these family gives you different kinds of configuration. One core CPU, one GB RAM, 10 core CPU, 10 GB RAM. There are different kinds of configurations available. Now, basically, these instance families are divided into five families, five top categories. One is general purpose. A general purpose is something that will give you balanced performance plus balanced budget. That is, if you are having a restriction of cost wise, then this general purpose will handle all the normal workloads for your system. Second is compute optimize. That is, these devices, these instances are having a high computing capacity that you can use for big data, for torrenting, for uh, batch processing. If you are using for this kind of things, you can go with the compute optimized system. If your interaction with the, your database that you have your own custom database in your EC2 machine, then you can go with the MIMT optimized. When you have high input output interaction with your database, uh, with your you know system, you can go with MIMT optimized system. Next is accelerated computing. Accelerated computing. Uh, provides you GPU, some gaming processor, graphic processing unit, etc. So if you are dealing with a gaming site or uh, you know where application load is very heavy, then you can go with accelerated computing. And lastly, you have storage optimized. So if you want uh, low latency read write data input output from your system, you can go with the storage optimized. Not basically. These are the top five categories. In each of this category, there are multiple subfamilies available. A family called T2, T3, M15, M25, C1, C2, C3, C5. And each of these subfamily includes various configuration like T2 Nano, T2 Micro, T2 Large, T2 X Large, T2 Twice Large, which offer different kinds of configuration. So based on your utilization, based on your scenario, you can go with one of the system. Now, what is the different families and what we, why we require that? Each of these subfamilies represent a certain processor. <clears throat> like T2 family represent Intel Xeon processor. T5 family represent some other processor. T, uh, T3 family represent a uh, Xeon processor with uh, 2.4 gigahertz stability so every different families will offer you different kinds of configurations here so let me just go back to the emi section and if i select the first one the second it will ask is me the instance type and here you can have a list of all the instance types. these are the general purpose family if i scroll down then i will have compute optimized network optimized gpu MMT optimized, etc. And here you can see the different com, uh, configuration. One we, we, one CPU, half GP RAM, one CPU, one GP RAM, one CPU, two GP RAM. There are different kinds of configurations available. But for free tier, only the T2 micro is eligible. You should go only for the T2 micro. So, 
so when i click on this t2 micro here you can see this belongs to 2.5 gigahertz intel xeon family which offers you 1 gp memory only just give me one second Okay, so this T2 family offers you one core CPU and one GPU RAM, which is only comes with your free tier. All right, any doubt in this instance family? Next part is the pricing model. Yeah. Next part is the pricing model. So there are different five kinds of pricing model, and this is very important to understand which one you should go for. First is on demand. On demand means if you want a server right now, you can get it without any permission, without any, any request. Just go to AWS console. The way that we are creating EC2 machine, you create, that's it. You can have your EC2 machine running for you. These are charged previously per hour basis. If you are consumed for 30 minutes, still you need to pay for 160 minutes. If you have consumed a particular server for 62 minutes, then you need to pay for 120 minutes. But recently, like uh, one or one and a half year back, AWS has rolled out the future and which is now offering you per second billing. So if you have consumed, uh, if you have consumed a particular EC2 machine for only few seconds, then you will be charged accordingly. Second comes a reserved one. A reserved one is something that comes with the two condition. You can go with a one year or three year. If you are using a particular server for the next one year or three year, then this reserve instance will be useful. Now, when you go with a reserve instance, you get 70, uh, you get 40 to 50 percent of discount on an on demand price. Let's consider if an on demand price is currently one dollar per, per hour, then reserve instance you will get in uh, 0 0.40, 0 0.50 anywhere. In that so you should go with the reserve instance for the production servers but before that you need to run a test case you need to define what is your term whether you should go for a tier one year term or three year term there is no term available for two year four year six year the term is only for one year and three year third is spot instance now to understand the spot instance is very much required let's say this is the amazon rack of spaces that is amazon number of uh, you know the servers are available for the t2 micro all right you are going for a t2 micro and this is the maximum capacity that aws is offering you that aws has this in data center and let's assume this is the t2 micro which having the capacity of one lakh servers with this hardware, this is the hardware which can create one lakh uh, T2 micro instances. Now let's see out of this one lakh EC2 machine, fifty thousand or uh, you know fifty yeah fifty thousand is already consumed by different AWS customers. We have created one server. I have created one server. We all are using different kinds of server. For this t2 micro all right so out of this one lakh t2 micro instances that as this hardware can support 50,000 is already consumed now what left in the aid of this data center it's a 50,000 more hardware capacity so when you request for a spot instance you use the unused capacity of that 50% that is whenever you request for an on demand ec2 machine you also get the same from the one lakh machines from the one lakh hardware you will get one of the resource allocated for you and at the same time when you go for a spot instance you will also get uh, get the ec2 machine from the unused space of aws but the difference will be 
if an on demand price is one dollar then on the spot instance you will find in uh with 70 to 90 percent of discount you will get from an on demand price up to 70 to 90 percent of discount but this is not reliable on a spot instance the pricing changes as the demand for the t2 micro increases or decreases the price of a spawn instance also changes and decreases so let's say for this t2 micro currently out of this one lakh of uh, hardware capacity 50000 is used let's say after one hour 70% of the consumption has been made to your entire hardware capacity now definitely the demand is increased if the demand is increased then the spot instance price is also increases so whenever you go for a spot instance price you need to first select the bidding price you need to define what is your maximum bidding price so let's say current bidding price is going around four dollars per hour so and uh, on demand price is somewhere eight dollar per hour all right just assume this is not that much high so if you go for a spot instance then you need to bid here let's say currently is four so let's say till five dollar per hour so from four hour which is current price the demand increases then you will have till five hours then you will have till five dollar it reaches the amount once this bidding price in reaches to your threshold here you will get one notification email notification that the bidding price has reached the threshold for your spot instance now you have two things now you have two things to do one you can terminate your ec2 machine or we will uh, sorry you have two things to do one you can increase your bidding price from five you can go to six seven whatever you want and second thing that you can do is you can just take a backup of your data or we will terminate your ec2 machine so in that case you do not you cannot rely on this spot instance did you get this spot instance or do you want me to repeat this is little tricky yeah guys Hello. Yeah. One second. Yeah. They have a question in case of backup. Uh, any additional charges will be there? Uh, sorry. One second. Uh, Lalit, uh, as you said, uh, in case uh, I want to terminate or uh, I want to shut down the uh, server, so right. you said uh, take the backup and uh, delete it out. So for taking the backup, will be a charge? Charge? uh no basically whenever you take a snapshot taking a snapshot is absolutely free but the amount of storage that you will consume that is chargeable for example if your data storage is 10 gb so if you are taking a snapshot definitely that will again cost you 10 gb of storage taking a snapshot in storage you All right. Yeah. So, spot instance is okay with you. What is spot instance? How you can uh, raise the spot instance and everything? Great. Then comes two things: dedicated instance and dedicated host. A dedicated instance is something that a single instance is completely dedicated to you. The entire hardware is dedicated to you, which is separated from other AWS account. Uh, we are sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, after this explanation, uh, you're going to show it uh, with this, you know, the pricing model on the AWS console, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now here comes these two things, dedicated instance and dedicated host. Dedicated instance is something that you talk about the single instance. That this single instance will be separated from other AWS account, from other hardware. You have a dedicated hardware for your EC2 machine. We are talking about just single EC2 machine. Whereas in the dedicated host, the entire hardware is dedicated to you. Now it's up to you. 
to configure how many servers you want to configure based on the hardware capacity you can do so on the dedicated instance you have only one easy machine on the dedicated host you have an entire hardware to create an infrastructure for you it's up to you how you want to distribute this network how you want to distribute that hardware into multiple servers next comes the user data a user data is something is called as bootstrapping of your machine uh, for a windows machine you can use a powershell script for a linux machine you can go with the batch script so here you will write a batch script that will automatically update the machine let's say while creation of this ec2 machine i will write a script that will download apache server that will configure and download mysql server that will write a file anything that you want to do before creation of this machine you can write a batch script so as soon as the batch script will be created you will have everything in your system so this is called bootstrapping of your machine next is im role we have already seen what is im role whenever you attach this im role you don't need to again hard code all the credentials everything is uh, pre-configured comes it directly to your system you don't need to hard code your xsp and secret key so next comes your instance life cycle how your life cycle works first is you select your ami and then you configure everything you launch the ec2 machine which goes under pending state so in this pending state, the EC2 machine will be booted. All the parameters will be downloaded, whatever you want to do. Uh, then it will come to the running state. And then whatever the batch kit that you have written, it will be applicable. It will uh, download all the batch kit configuration, whatever the command that you have passed, it will run one by one. Once the EC2 machine comes to the running phase, now you have three things to do. Reboot, terminate, or stop. If you reboot this machine, it will stop and again come back to the running state. If you terminate this machine, it will go under shutting down state and the machine will be terminated. A machine is terminated means your EC2 instance is terminated. You have an option to take a data out of it and then terminate. That is, you can do. You have complete flexibility that you remove the SSD storage from that EC2 machine and download the server and then you have third option to stop the server so when you click on stop it will do on the stopping stage and then it will be stopped now once the machine is in stop now you have two things that you can perform you can terminate a stop machine that is again if you want if you no longer require you can just delete the machine and then you can start the machine so the machine will be go on a pending state and it will again run the server. Now stopping this machine and starting this machine again, it only works on EBS backed instance only. So now we have two things, EBS and instance store. These are the two storage types that can be used to boot your system. What EBS is? Elastic Block Storage, which is also called as Persistent Storage System. Instant Store is non persistent, which means it is an ephemeral storage system. Whatever the data you will write into this instant store, it will be only uh, accessible till the EC2 instance is running. Once you stop the EC2 machine, your data will be completely lost. It's a temporary storage of your data. Whereas in EBS volume, whatever the data you will write, it will be a permanent write. You can reboot your machine n number of times. You can stop your server, start your server n number of times, and it will not affect your data. So these are the two systems that AWS offers, instance store, and the EBS. Now, when you stop a server and you restart the server, this will only be useful when you have the EBS volume. The instant store will not be useful in that case. Next term is a placement group. 
A placement group is a group, it's a logical group basically. Let's consider there are four servers. All right, there are four nodes which interact with each other to create a server, to create a resource to process the data. Let's say it's a batch processing system. So to this, uh, there are four nodes which work, uh, you know, uh, which uh, communicate with each other to do the processing. So these four nodes require a continuous communication with each other. Now, when you place this all the four nodes into a placement group, you increases its bandwidth, first of all. The internet bandwidth connection is increases and there will be a, a, a very less latency between these two servers. Between this four server, there will be a low latency network. So how this low latency will work? From a different hardware, when you create and attach this EC2 instance into a common group, that is the placement group, these hardwares are connected together and form a placement group. That this EC2 machine can talk to this EC2 machine, another EC2 machine can talk to another EC2 machine. It's like a mesh topology. Every EC2 instance in a group can contact to each other like they are just connected to each other uh, with a dedicated link. So it creates a private link between two servers. It's called placement group. All right. The EC2 servers, EC2 attempts to place the instance in such a way that all of your instances are spread across different underlying hardware to make uh, to minimize the correlative failures. You can use the placement to influence the placement group of a group for independent instances to meet the needs of your workload. So they all the EC2 instances which is created in different different hardware that will come closer to each other and it will act like a dedicated link between two EC2 machines. Like they are just connected via private link. That is placement group. Now the last concept here is T2, T3 unlimited. As you can see here, there are different kinds of families available. Here we have T2 families, then we have T3, A family. Here we have T3 family, N5, AD family. There are different kinds of families available. But this feature is only available to T2 and T3 family. What is family? What is this T2, T3 unlimited? every ec2 will have certain cpu credits whenever you create a ec2 machine you will get certain credits based on your utilization based on your instance type you will get credits for a t2 micro you get sys credits by default right now what is the six credit one credit is equal to one virtual CPU, one credit is equal to one CPU consume for next one minute, then one credit is utilized. That if T2 Micro is offering you one core CPU and one GP RAM, then one, one of this one core CPU, if it is running at 100% utilization, for next one minute, then one credit will be consumed. So does that mean six credit, if you are offering, then six credits is equal to 100% utilization till next six minutes. What will happen after that EC2 machine? Can you just think for a minute, what will happen to that EC2 machine if a EC2 machine is running at 100% of utilization for six minutes, then it means you have used or consumed entire six credit. So what will happen to your EC2 machine then? Yeah, sorry, didn't get you. Once again. Yes, I was thinking that. Uh, 
one, you know, it might, you know, get into a hang mode, it can stop, or else if the auto scale is enabled, probably it will scale up with, you know, air billing. Yeah. If an auto scaling is enabled, then it will create another server. But uh, if this is a very small lifespan for each of the server is available, then uh, I don't think so. This is, uh, you know, we should design our infrastructure on the cloud. This is a very, very small lifespan. That is six minutes, just six minutes. So what happens technically? For a T2 micro, you get six credit. Now, every single minute or all the time, you will be not running at the 100%, correct? You will be not running an EC2 machine always at 100%. It may be running at 40%, 50%, 70%, 80%, somewhere. Let's consider this running at 40% of utilization all the time. Or let's say most of the time. Then 60% of the uh, resources are free. So this 60% will work to gain extra credits. So in that case, if you have six credit, somewhere tomorrow, you will have 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. So your lifespan will automatically increase. The credits will automatically increase as you have low resource utilization in your system. So this rest of the 60% will gain the extra credits for you. So sometimes you will have 10, 12, 15 credits. Let's consider a hypothetical situation. You have reached to get 12 credits. All right. But next day you have such a heavy workload that all 12 credits has been consumed. Then what? Again, the instances will be stopped. You are no longer able to be accessible to this EC2 machine. So in that case, what will happen? You can enable this T2, T3 unlimited option. What it will do is it will credit, it will take a credit from AWS and it will add to your EC2 machine. That is instead of 12, now it will take some credits from AWS, maybe plus 5, maybe plus 10, and still your EC2 instance will be working. It will no it will not go down. And once your traffic goes down, again you have uh, you know. Uh, again, you have reached to 40% of utilization, 60% is free. Again, the number of, uh, you know, uh, the credits that you will gain, it will be compensated with the 10 credits. You need to repay that 10 credits to the AWS. Did you get this part? What T2, T3 offers oh, you? Uh, these yeah. credits is based on the, uh, the timeline or what? Uh, for example, in one month, uh, I just utilized only 20% of the uh, uh, instance and uh, how, how this credit is going to be uh, increased based on the utilization. Okay, this credits are not based on the per month utilization or per annual per hour basis. This is number of free resources available per millisecond. If 60% of the utilization is available for 10 milliseconds, then 10 milliseconds credits you will be get in your AWS account for that particular EC2 machine. The number of milliseconds, the free resources are available in your system, they will gain new credits. Now to have T2, T3 unlimited, that will work as a credit to all, it's called a surplus credit to your EC2 machine, you need to pay extra to the AWS. For running up this service, for enabling this option, you need to pay extra to the AWS. And then I don't think that. Lalit, good evening. In yeah. T2 Micro, we have six credits, no? If my right. CPU utilization is 100% for six minutes, right? Uh, okay. in every minute it's going 600%. So what will be happened in seventh minute? Your EC2 machine will stop. You are no longer accessible yes. to that EC2 machine. 
so i can take that data backup and i can restart no right reboot. yeah you can reboot the machine you can restart the machine uh after so that if my my data uh, when i'm taking backup if it was failed then no basically this is on the instance right okay. and your data is stored on the ebs mm. what fail is your instance is failed to perform but your ebs volume is still available your data is still available you can take okay. any time to take a backup use this uh, ebs volume to create a new ec2 machine and your system is at working again thank you it will not affect to your data it will just affect to your instance oh all right yeah. did you get this very clearly all right Spot yeah, anything uh, doubt you have? All right. Uh, yeah, tell me. All right. So you have to, uh, this kinds of two tenancy models available. One is the default tenancy, and second is the dedicated tenancy. The difference is that a single hardware is share between multiple customers you have customer one who has created this ec2 machine customer two created the same ec2 machine on the same hardware when the dedicated a single customer will create multiple resources for it the entire hardware is dedicated to a single customer whereas for the default or the shared one a single hardware is shared between multiple users So that's the theoretical part of our EC2 section. If you have any doubt, let me know. Can you please go to the previous slide? Uh, last, yeah. last slide. Yeah, yeah. Here? The last slide. This one. Could you please elaborate this? Uh, I didn't get it. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is the Zen hypervisor. Hypervisor is nothing but your virtual machine, right? The machine that will create a virtual environment for you. Now, on top of this hardware, on AWS data centers, whenever you require an on-demand EC2 machine, this a part of this hardware will be allocated to a single customer. Same if a new customer, that is you, are requesting same EC2 machine, if it belongs to the same hardware, then this hardware will be allocated to that particular user. That we all different AWS customer uses the same hardware to create our resources. But AWS guarantees that your data is completely isolated. Your EC2 machine is completely isolated on that hardware. This is when it comes to the shared or the default instance tenancy type. Second tenancy is dedicated hardware uh, it's not a dedicated instance it's a dedicated host so on top of this hardware the entire hardware is dedicated to a single customer but a single customer can be to instance one is to instance two is to instance three is to instance four the entire hardware is dedicated to a single customer all right okay So we have now a lab session. That is how you can create a EC2 machine and everything. But it's actually a 4 p.m. already. So what do you want me to? It's already a time. It is just you know the lab session for EC2. Uh, it will be a very big session again because creation of this EC2 machine will take a, at least 40 45 minutes. So when we are planning to take our next session? Actually it is planned for next week, Thursday. On Thursday, that is on uh, 2nd of August. Or first tomorrow. Month. Okay, 1st of August, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's like every Thursday or like uh, when you have
Hello. And uh, like that only, like now every week, uh, one day. Okay, every week, one day. Uh, is it yeah. possible, like, can we wrap up early, like, uh, once or twice in a week? Uh, let's, you know, uh, we'll discuss internally and keep you posted, uh, Lele. Because that is something like, uh, depending on the work as well. So, no, as of now, we have planned like that, but we'll internally discuss and let you know if any possibilities there. Sure, sure, sure. No issue. And uh, if you have any other topics which can be covered in the next 30 minutes, you know, you can go ahead. Um, not as of now, this will be a very big topic. All right, let's uh, understand one thing. Let's now, every EC2 machines come up with three types of, or any network comes up with three types of IP address. One is public IP, second is private IP, and third, that AWS offers you is Elastic IP. Can you tell anyone tell me the difference between public and private IP? What is exactly a public and private IP? Yeah, public uh, basically is like an internet IP, uh, which is uh, accessible to anybody. Private is uh, maybe you can call it a uh, dedicated IP, which is being given to uh, an intranet. And elastic IP will be uh, like a dynamic IP. Okay. So, public IP is something that is can be accessible from the internet. Like even if our system also have a public IP, right? This IP are dynamic, first of all. This can be accessible from the internet. This is dynamic. If I change my network type, or if I reboot my machine, this IP will automatically change. So first of all, this is internet IP. And second is this dynamic IP. Second is a private IP. Private IP is for only internal purpose. Your router is the one who defines or who register your computer with an internal IP. And you can have communication over this internal IP. Like I have three systems on the same network. So all the three systems I can communicate with each other via this internal IP. I don't require any internet connection for that. So this is for the internal routing purpose only. Now, the last one is the Elastic IP, which is offered by the AWS. Elastic IP is something that is also called as Internet IP, but this time this is static. A dynamic IP is something that will change automatically whenever you restart your server, whenever you restart your host machine or any network drive, this dynamic IP changes automatically. This is Elastic IP, which is also internet-based IP, and it's a static IP. Where you can use this system? Let's say I have one server, which is required for my application. I have one system domain, domain.com, running, all right? For this domain, I need to always ping this server. My domain is always ping to 192.168, blah, blah. Anything IP address, all right? And this is an internet public IP. This is configuration I have already set. Now, in case if the server restarts, then the IP will change. If the IP will change, then domain will not ping to this site because there is no such servers available in your system. The IP has already changed. So, the link between your domain and your server will be lost. So, in that case, Elastic IP, you can use the Elastic IP, which is always steady. Whenever you get it, this IP after remains constant, it will not change. So it doesn't matter how many times the server is restarted, this Elastic IP will be always attached to your domain. So these are the three types of IPs. Now the condition with this Elastic IP is, you get five Elastic IP per region in your AWS account. And the charges are high you don't get in your free tier this elastic ip charges are high these charges are depend on two factors one if you have created an elastic ip and if you have associated to a running ec2 machine then 
it will be very minimal charge. But if you have created an elastic IP and didn't associate it to any running machine, then it will be very highly chargeable. Because elastic IP you get from an Amazon secret pool of public IP. Amazon maintains this public IP, this elastic IP and get associated to your AWS account. So it is highly chargeable if you have created an elastic IP and not using to any running instance. So always make sure that you have a plastic IP running for a uh, using for a running machine. All right. So I think let's stop here only because the rest of the part the lab session is very uh, big. So we will require an entire hour to accomplish that thing. All right. Uh, okay, like, uh, so how do we get this uh, presentation file and the recording? Uh, is uh, Shivan uh, is going to share the link to us? Oh. Yeah, Shashan will share all the things with you, the recordings and every data. E even the presentation file also, right? Uh, presentation, I need to check once. <laughs> so, uh, let me check uh, with uh, him once again, and then I will share. Mm -hmm. Or otherwise, I can refer, I would refer you like you can go to the AWS documentation that will be very helpful because this contains some older data also, which is not updated. Mm -hmm. So how do you like the overall session? Is it helpful? Yeah, yeah certainly, you know, uh, it was helpful. So, any suggestions or any updation you want to do, like if there are any problems, let us me know. Yeah, we will go to the items you know which we discussed today, mm -hmm. and if any queries, you know, uh, probably before starting the next session on the same day, like uh, we will just initially for half an hour we can discuss on that, and uh, we can get started with the remaining uh, topics. All right, all right, sure. So from my side, you don't require any change. Whatever we are doing. Is perfect for you, right? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, we are covering the actual things. You know what is really required. Right? So, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Basically, mm -hmm. I have just talk about the theoretical part. Once we go to the lab session and we'll see one by one things how you can configure all the data. What is the use of all the resources? At that time, it will be really helpful to you, and at that time, you will more understand that part. Okay. Okay. So that's why I suggested like if we can have twice in a week, so it will be like a you know continuous session. Otherwise, it will be like a, you have. See, the, the plan was that you know to have at least you know uh, seven to eight hours in a day in a in breaking uh, into like two sessions. So what do you think like you know next next day uh, next sessions uh, you know uh, next uh, you know the training uh, day you want to take it to the seven or eight hours like how you want to take it up? What's your idea on that? uh basically on thursday it won't be possible if you want to have six hours of session then we can do on monday or monday is me something free i am free mm. uh, well, you see the dates were already been given to uh, uh, and also the rahul let's discuss on that you know because basically we have time certain way uh, because you know the people are from the different uh, departments and right Okay. So, we will keep you posted, you know, either way. Um, but the session was good, you know, we are covering the most of the part. Uh, certainly, it's helpful. And uh, about the signing day, definitely, we will keep you posted and also like we'll discuss with you, Rahul and Shubham. Sure, sure, sure. Let me know and we can plan accordingly. All right. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, thanks a lot, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thanks. See you next time, yeah, next weekend, probably. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye.